Each day this week, we've investigated one of the hymns we sing at Christmas time. You know, there's significant theology in these hymns, but sometimes we're so caught up in the sentiment of Christmas, we fail to see the deeper truth in the carols. Well, it's been my purpose all this week to enhance our appreciation of the Savior and the carols we sing about Him. And today's no exception. Our Christmas carol today is, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, don't be like the little boy who claimed he knew the name of one of the Christmas angels because he thought this hymn said, Hark, Harold the Angel Sings. Now, Harold is not a masculine name. These angels were heralds. They were commissioned to announce the good news that the long night of darkness was over and the day star was about to arise. Well, this carol is particularly well known to us. Uh, perhaps that's because the author is none other than Charles Wesley. You know, Wesley penned the words to more than 6,500 hymns. You can visit Wesley's home in Bristol, England, and see the table he used where he wrote many of these hymns. In fact, on the table, there's an inkwell and a pen, along with the first draft of a hymn in Wesley's handwriting. Charles Wesley was the youngest of 19 children born to Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Samuel was the rector at the parish church in Epworth, England. Uh, by the way, Epworth is very near Bawtry, where the Back to the Bible offices are located in Great Britain. Each time my responsibilities take me to our British office, I try to sneak over to the Wesley home in Epworth just to imbibe a little bit of the spirit and the flavor of this family. John Wesley, you know, the older brother of Charles, was the founder of the Methodist movement. Well, Charles Wesley wrote many hymns, but Hark the Herald Angels Sing surely is the most popular of all his Christmas hymns. In fact, a noted hymnologist said that this is one of the four most popular hymns in the English language. Eventually, Wesley's words were published in a hymnal compiled by his dear friend George Whitfield. The date of that was 1753. But originally, they were published in 1739, and the first line of this Christmas hymn was this. Hark! How all the welkin rings glory to the King of Kings. Now, do you know what welkin means? It's an archaic word. It means heavens or sky. Charles Wesley originally wrote, Hark! How all the sky rings glory to the King of Kings. But I, for one, am glad he changed welkin to Hark! The Herald Angel Sings. Just sounds a lot better, doesn't it? It makes more sense, too. Now, if you look in your hymnal, you'll note that the music to this hymn was composed by the famous Felix Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn and Charles Wesley were not contemporaries. Mendelssohn was born into a Jewish Christian home, 1809, in Hamburg, Germany. He became a noted performer and a conductor, but also a prolific composer. His works included symphonies, chamber music, concertos, as well as much organ, piano, and vocal music. Now, actually, the tune for Hark the Herald Angel Sing was adapted from the second movement of Felix Mendelssohn's Festgesang, Opus 68. That was composed in 1840. And you may see at the top of the hymn the name William Cummings, because he's the man who made this adaptation. Well, that tells us who wrote the hymn and uh, who composed the music, but what about the beloved hymn itself? What makes this so beloved to us? Well, I think it's not because of the wonderful music, but it's because of the wonderful message of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. As in the case of so many of Charles Wesley's hymns, the text of this carol is like a condensed course in biblical doctrine in poetic form. Hark, the herald angels sing. The whole thing is just filled with the truth of Christ's virgin birth and his deity, the necessity for the new birth. Wesley even shows a deep concern for Christ-like living. In short, folks, this carol of Christmas has it all. One noted English hymnist, Eric Rutley, said in his book, Hymns and Human Life, These Wesley hymns were composed in order that men and women might sing their way, not only into experience, but also into knowledge. That the cultured might have their culture baptized and the ignorant might be led into truth by the gentle hand of melody and rhyme. Now, that's quite a statement, but isn't it so true? 
the cultured have their culture baptized. Charles Wesley wrote for both the head and the heart, and nowhere do we see this better than in this gentle combination of his Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So, let's probe the deeper meanings of this Christmas carol. See, Wesley was a master of words. I eventually want to focus on a phrase in the last stanza of this hymn, but there are just too many good things obstructing our pathway to the final stanza. For example, in the first stanza, Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn king, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. You see, Wesley puts all those words into the mouth of the angels. Now, just think about that. God and sinners reconciled. That reminds us that Jesus Christ did not come to be a baby. He did not come to put the little town of Bethlehem on the map. He didn't come to give us a fuzzy feeling at Christmas time. Jesus came to reconcile two estranged parties, God and us. We human beings have become estranged from God because of our disobedience. And Jesus came to bridge the gap. He came to bring God and man together again, to pay the penalty for our sinful disobedience. Remember what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. You see, my friend, the babe in Bethlehem's manger was God's answer to man's need. We're reconciled to God when we receive his payment, the payment for the penalty of our sin. Do you know what that payment is? God's payment is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a Christmas truth that you can really chew on this Christmas season. The second stanza of Wesley's Christmas hymn says this, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Now, I think Charles Wesley is hinting at a biblical truth that the incarnation of Christ did not make him what he already was, but what he already was, the incarnation simply revealed. For example, Jesus did not become the Son of God at his incarnation. He always existed as the God Son. If he didn't, There could never have eternally existed God as Father. So Jesus did not come to be Lord. He did not become Lord when he became man. As Wesley writes, Christ was the everlasting Lord. Jesus did become a man at his incarnation, and that's the whole point of the incarnation. That's the whole point of his birth. But he did not become God in Bethlehem. You see, the Apostle Paul was right in Romans chapter 1. He said that God's Son, Jesus Christ, was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power. Now, you see, the apostle used two different words there. Jesus was born or made the seed of David. But he was not born or made the Son of God. He was simply declared to be the Son of God. You see, you don't have to make a person something they already are. You just declare them to be who they are. And Charles Wesley understood that. But there's another wonderful phrase standing in the way of our getting to this last stanza. It's veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Wesley was very interested in our singing the praises of the God who became flesh, not just the babe in Bethlehem's manger. This was no ordinary baby. This was the incarnate deity. This was God wrapped in skin and bones. This was the unique God-man, the divine incarnation of the eternal Son of God. He was veiled in flesh. But if you look into Jesus' soul, you see that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. What a great hymn this is. Charles Wesley points us to the Prince of Peace. He focuses on Jesus as the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N. We see him as the light and life, just as John saw him. Jesus is the great physician. He's the resurrection and the life of the believer. He was born that man no more would die. He was born to give us second birth. All that is in Hark the Herald Angels Sing. 
But if there's one designation for Jesus that Charles Wesley helps us to understand, surely it's this. Jesus is the desire of all nations. You'll find that expression in the last stanza. Jesus is the desire of all nations. Now, what does that mean? Well, to completely understand, I think we have to go back to the Old Testament book of Haggai, writing to the Jews after their return from Babylonian exile. Haggai warns the Jews with these words, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations and I will fill this temple with glory. Now that prophecy is Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Haggai's prophecy is a warning to Israel. It's a warning that God will bring future judgment, the likes of which makes the Babylonian captivity look like preschool. This judgment will shake the heaven and the earth. But out of this horrible, horrible judgment will come the desire of all nations. Now, it's pretty obvious, folks, that this is a reference to Jesus and that this reference is yet unfulfilled. It's something the world is yet awaiting. But you see, Charles Wesley understood that. And so he included in his great hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, he included this designation that Jesus is the desire of all nations. Doesn't look like that's true today, does it? But just wait. One day it will be true. Charles Wesley had a wonderful way of taking theology and prophecy and poetry and weaving them together in such a way as to create one of the most popular Christmas carols of all time. Hark, the herald angels sing. So what can we take home from this carol today? Well, take this. Listen to the last stanza and think of it as a prayer. In fact, if you're in a position you can do this, why don't you just shut your eyes right now and think this through in a prayerful way? Make this your prayer today. If you can join me, pray with me as we think about the last stanza of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Come, desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Rise, the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness, now efface. Stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Father, focus our attention this Christmas on the one who can take away the sinful image of Adam and replace it with his own image. Help us to see the image of Christ's righteousness this Christmas season. Let us focus on the desire of all nations and the one who is light and life. Lord, keep us from thinking about presents and friends and parties and gifts. Help us to see the real meaning of Christmas. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Christmas filled with Christ at the center. In whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow. God bless you.